Let's have a look at a simple mathematical problem, the train meet problem. Let's say that we have two trains going out from cities A and B towards each other at different speeds. We at the moment don't specify speeds or distances. The question is when and where the trains will meet before continuing on their way. If you recall how to solve this problem from your school knowledge, you should know that first we need to define the distance between cities. Then we need to define the speeds of individual trains. Then we need to compute the combined speed at which those trains approach each other. And finally we need to divide the distance the trains need to travel by the combined speed so that we know the time at which they meet. After that we can use the velocity of train A or train B to get distance they traveled since their departure. What we have just described is in essence the algorithm for solving this problem. If you write this down one line at a time, you will see that we are performing some operation on every step and this operation results in some new information that we didn't have at the beginning of the step. And this is what algorithms are. The algorithms are descriptions, sometimes verbal, sometimes in the form of flowchart, sometimes a program code, but the algorithms describe how exactly you want to transform your input data into your output data step by step. What we have described is suitable for a human to solve because humans know how to get velocity of a train from text information given as input. Humans understand how to compute the distance between cities. If we have coordinates for the cities as input, then the human would know that you need to take a Euclidean distance between towns or sum up length of track segments between these cities. However, if you want a computer to solve this problem, you need to be more specific. The algorithms that a computer will understand can only contain elementary blocks. Only these blocks are implemented in computer's hardware. So if you want your computer to know what you want it to do with the data you provided, you have to specify your algorithm in those elementary blocks. What are these blocks? For starters, we have the variables that contain some units of information. Typically, a variable can be either what's called simple data type or a complex data type. A simple variable is either a number or a character in string or a pointer to some variable. So it is an elementary unit of information. In computer sciences and computation, we refer to the absolute minimal unit of information as one bit. However, we typically don't operate on bits when we are doing large-scale computations. Then, we usually use variables that are several bits long. For a standard desktop computer nowadays, that would be a 64-bit sized integer or 64-bit or so-called double precision float as a number. Why these numbers? They are due to bitness of the processor. The bitness defines the capacity of your processor in terms of the size of individual operations. For example, a 32-bit processor will only operate on integers that are 32-bit wide and on floats that are single precision floats. On the other hand, a 64-bit processor typically operates on 64-bit integers and double precision floats. However, when you don't think about those bits, a variable is just a number from an algorithm's perspective. It can be an integer number or a floating point number. Mathematics defines integer numbers as numbers that you can write without the fractional parts. So that would be all natural numbers, their opposites and zero. Floating point numbers are also familiar to you if you have done any science or engineering work because floating numbers follow scientific or engineering notation for numbers. They are composed of two numbers. The first part is the mantissa. This number is typically from minus 1 to 1 and contains some lone fractional part. The second part is the exponent. The numbers are thus written as mantissa times 10 to the power of the exponent. However, in the case of computer sciences, the mantissa is recorded in binary form, and the exponential part is 2 to the power of exponent instead of 10. That is the difference between mathematics and the computer sciences. We will talk more about this a bit later in this course. Let's discuss a bit what you can do with this information. For example, you have a variable that you define to represent a distance between two cities, and that value is not provided as input to the problem. Let's say instead you have city location in the form of either one-dimensional or two-dimensional coordinates for some coordinate grid as input. You want to make a difference between the position of city A and the position of city B. To do that, you will need to perform an operation. Those positions would be your input parameters, and they are called operands, and the calculated value is called the result of operation. The computer can only execute one operation at a time. When we write written or verbal descriptions of algorithms, and even in the code, we can describe much more complex calculations as a single algorithm step. However, a computer will still execute these things in their mathematical priority, starting from the highest priority operations to the lower ones and it will store the output sequentially to temporary variables. And finally, it will write the result into the variable you want to set to the outcome of the computation. This property of calculations is essential to understand as it plays a critical role in concurrent computations. With these blocks, our computer can already function as a decent calculator. However, 
In some cases, you will also need to perform nonlinear operations. For example, a computer will not understand a modulo operation. There is no modulo operation in the instruction set of at least some processors. We can implement modulo operation in the following way. You can check the sign of your input and then do either one of two operations. You can either write into the result your original variable or write the opposite of that variable. How do we explain the computer how to decide which action to take? Such operations are called branching or conditional execution, for which we use conditional operators. For example, this could be if clause that exists in almost every programming language. This clause consists of three essential parts. The input of that clause is some condition. So in our case, we want to conduct an operation on our input resulting in a Boolean or logical variable. A logical variable can be either true or false. We take x as input, and you can check if x is greater than zero and save that transformation into a temporary logical variable. Let's name it condition. Then we take that condition, and if condition is true, then the clause executes the operation in the success branch that sets the result to x. Otherwise, when the condition is false, then the fail branch is executed, and the result is set to minus x. In algorithms, the condition lines are often a single line that performs one of two simple operations, or even just one operation with the fail path being the execution of the next step. On the other hand, in the code, the branching instructions frequently include large blocks of code and nest within each other. Finally, problems often require doing the same operation multiple times with some variation. For example, someone might want to check these distances and times not for single but for multiple trains. For example, if we have a large railroad grid with many trains and they are going from one place to another and we need to check at which times, if ever, every pair of trains might intersect and in which location that will happen. We require this information to ensure we have two rail lines and not a single line on those positions to avoid collisions. For that purpose, it would be foolish to write the same problem again and again manually, writing all possible combinations of input data about trains. Instead, it would be wider to have a list with input parameters for every train, and then we will do iterations over those input values. For each pair, we can execute our current solution as a sub-program or as a function. To do that, we will take the input from the list, let's say we take the first train and the second train, and then the first train and the third train, first train and the fourth train, and so on. And then we go on for every pair that is possible to implement with the first train. And then we will switch the second one and go from the second and third, second and fourth, and so on. And for each of those, we will call the same function and check for results and see whether the result is satisfactory or not. Maybe we want to output all the results somehow, sequentially. Or perhaps we only wish to check if the result means that we have some invalid or dangerous situation. What we are doing here is called looping through the list of inputs. In fact, we have two loops. One is for the first train's index in the pair, and the other is for the index of the second train in the pair. Loops and iterations are implemented in our processors by what are called execution flow transfer functions. These instructions might be conditional or unconditional. Unconditional instructions change the next step to be executed from the next one to the other, specified in the instruction. In the case of a verbal algorithm, this might sound like go to step n, where n is some step number that exists in the algorithm. In programming, n is also referred to as a label. A conditional jump is a mix of a condition clause and unconditional jump. Here is how we turn this into a simple loop. Let's say we have defined a variable right before the loop. We call that variable iteration. We will also define a label at the first step of a loop, and we will execute our distance computation function at every iteration, providing the value of iteration as input. After we compute the result for this iteration value, we increase that variable by one. Finally, we will check the condition. To do that, we will take our iteration variable and compare its value to the number of trains. If this variable is less than the number of trains, we will jump back to the label. Otherwise, we will proceed with the execution of the next instruction of the program. What I have just described is called a for loop. Such loop is a construct for iterating a single variable from its initial value to the final value, with some step increments on every iteration. Another advantage of this code is that we are using code from the previous iteration that could only deal with a single pair of trains. We can further move the loop's content into a separate sub-algorithm for which we will define sets of inputs, returned results, and local variables that only exist within that function. This sub-algorithm is not an elementary block anymore. However, we can use it because it is fully defined in terms of elementary ones. The main benefit of doing so is that we can abstract from the specific elementary actions that we need to implement that sub-block and think instead on a slightly higher level. Such sub-algorithms in programming are called functions, subroutines or procedures. 
The latter is a term used mainly in a few older programming languages. It denoted primarily functions that would not return results and instead produce other actions called side effects. An example of a side effect in programming is writing some data to output or database. In this course, I will use the term function to refer to the sub-algorithms regardless of their inputs, outputs, or side effects. With these elementary blocks and the function as a tool of abstraction, you can implement any algorithm. This programming approach is commonly referred to as imperative programming. Later in this lecture, I will present the implementation of this style of programming in Python. To recap, the main blocks of any algorithm, they are variables storing some numbers, mathematical operations, the elementary ones, Usually you can consider the addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, comparisons and logical operators such as AND, OR, XOR to be elementary. Besides, you can consider elementary mathematical functions that are provided by either the standard library of functions that comes with your programming language or functions from external libraries that you added to your project. Then you will have branching that allows you to do non-linear things and select blocks of code depending on the condition. And building on top of branches, you will have loops that allow you to perform the same code multiple times with varying parameters. Finally, on top of that, you have functions, blocks of code that you can extract from your main algorithm and then reuse multiple times. You will start more or less immediately using some, for example, input and output functions in Python that the standard library of Python provides to you. You don't have to have a deep understanding of how they are working. From the perspective of algorithms, they only take some data from user and write it into a variable or output some variable's current value.